That's right. That was the root. I will not apologize. Coming back from the music break, CP3 live on Sports on the Hill podcast, True Radio Network, streaming live on Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope for Redskins Talk, episode 176, first episode of the new year. Redskins season is over. We had a great wild card weekend. We're definitely going to talk about that in detail in this Redskins segment, NFL Talk. But we have Sports Journey writer and insider Dujanae Bland, and we also have Redskins writer and insider, and someone that's at the park every day, not one of these guys that's there once a week or call into the water boy or the towel boy getting these anonymous sources. We have the people that's there, that's out there every day, that's covering the NFL, that's covering the team, that's not giving you that clickbait. It's not giving you that inflammatory, negative, always point of view. We give you the real X's and O's insight and knowledge coming to you live on Sports on the Hill podcast. Now, before I bring them on, I'm going to give my two-sentence synopsis of this uh, past season and what's transpired, and then I will definitely bring them on and get their comments and their reactions and make sure you check it out. If you got any comments, feel free to chime in on the Facebook live feed or any of them or call in on the True Radio Network hotline at 347-884-9299. Now, we had a eventful yet disappointing season for the Redskins, 3-13, and which I we uh, didn't agree with, but a few analysts said that that would happen, so I have no problem saying that I was totally incorrect about what this team was capable of at the hands of Jay Gruden, but we had some transition. Bill Callahan took over after 0-5 start. He won three out of the next 11 games. Unfortunately, he would not be retained. Ron Rivera is the new head coach with his buddy uh, Jack Del Rio coming to take over the defense. They're still negotiating on an offensive coordinator who's going to cover it. Uh, uh, turn, uh, Scott Turner, North Turnison, which I'm not a fan of. Uh, Kevin O'Connell, which I think only makes sense. And uh, the other name was uh, Pat Shermer, actually, name has came up, the Giants head coach that just got fired recently. Um, I think this franchise is in a good position right now. Uh, I was riding for Bill Callahan to take over, but after listening to Rivera and looking at his track record and seeing what he's done so far, I have the utmost confidence that he will be able to take this team and this franchise to the next level and hopefully finally get us out of the mediocrity and the inconsistency that we've been used to and that the Redskins fans are really tired of experiencing. So uh, you guys have already heard my two cents. I'm going to go ahead and bring on some of the experts and uh, insiders that have more knowledge than me in some categories. Let me go ahead and bring in Dujanae. We haven't spoken in a while. It's been a couple of weeks since we've been on. Dujanae, how are you doing tonight? Good, sir. I'm doing really good. Carol, how you doing? Uh, doing pretty good, doing pretty good, maintaining. Got some software issues that I'm working with, but we're going to make it work. I'm going to go ahead and bring in Diane also because we might as well get this roundtable rocking and rolling because I know folks is tuning in to get this good red skin news with all the stuff we got going on. Diane, how are you doing tonight? I'm great, Carol. It's so good to talk to you. It's been a while. I love your energy. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, yes, uh, with I love all it. of these moves, all of these moves. Yeah, it's uh, definitely get you excited. I know fans are wishing are ready for the 2020 season to start already with the moves that they <laughs> yep. made in the press conference that uh, that uh, Ron Rivera had. But uh, I got a couple of questions I want to ask you about the past season, you and Dujane, and then we'll talk about the uh, all the changes that's happened. So Diane, I'll start with you. I mentioned the three and thirteen finish, and uh, as some predicted. Uh, what player to you stuck out in each phase of the game, offense, defense, and special teams that you feel, you know, made a name or, you know, exceeded expectations for you on each side of the ball? And Dujanae, I'll go to you after her. You know, I got to say, I mean, it goes without saying that Tressway was the special teams player for me, although Steven Sims made some great, you know, plays once he got the ball into his hands, but I'm so glad that Tress finally got to the Pro Bowl and it's way he's way underrated and should have been there a couple of years ago. Um, offensively, Terry McLaurin is going to be somebody that people talk about, but you know what I love? I love the strides that uh, Dwayne Haskins made once he started. 
So that's going to be my offensive guy. Um, I know there's some people out there that don't think he's all all of that, but I love the guy, and I think he made some great strides. Love to see him just progress week to week. And defensively, I'm never, ever, besides the linebacking core, which I think really, with all the injuries and everything, held their own, I will never stop singing the praises of Matt Ioannidis. Even though Jerron Payne is a beast and Jonathan Allen is right there, Matt Ioannidis is underrated. So those are my three guys this season is, is Dwayne Haskins, Tressway, and Matt, I, Matt Ioannidis defensively. The secondary needs so much help. They just not even going to mention them. So those are my those are my guys. Uh, I cannot disagree with you. I've always said Tressway has been the team MVP for the last three or four yeah. seasons with his uh, great putting and being able to flip field position and, you know, just the good job that he's done. Uh, I cannot argue. And Matt Ioannidis, I, I say the same thing. His uh, When he first came out, you know, I looked at the write-up, said that he was a physical talent, but he needed work with technique. Uh, Tom Sewell right. definitely has uh, helped him greatly. He and, made his yeah, mark, didn't he? He's been a pro bowl yeah. awesome. Yeah, definitely did, yep. definitely did. Dujane, yep. what, uh same question to you. Which player stood out to you on offense, defense, and special teams for this team in this un, un, uh, disappointing season, unfortunately? <clears throat> well, I'm going to go with Eric Flowers. Uh, we talked about it uh, training camp at length. The fact that if he could move inside, um, you know, everybody's all freaking out where he was playing, where he was starting at, and we all understood why he was there. Um, and, and he didn't look good doing it. But I specifically said if you move this guy inside with his height and strength, if he can just learn uh, to bend his knees a little bit, if he can refine his technique, he could be successful. And sure enough, uh, you'd have to, you know, argue that he was, if not the best player on the offensive line this year, um, at least one of the best players there. Um, so that would be my first guy offensively, uh, Calvin Harmon. Uh, once he finally got an opportunity to see more reps, um, you can really see his abilities. I talked about that also in training camp and being able to see him uh, college and whatnot. And uh, really a guy who it was kind of went under the radar, um, yeah, along with, you know, Steven Sims. Um, but he really pulled it out and showed what he is capable of here down the stretch uh, once Callahan started using him a little bit more. Um and you saw his abilities and what he can do. Um, so I, I like what he brings. And that doesn't mean you don't add any more receivers, but I think you have to be really comfortable with your receiving core on how it stands with those three guys, uh, Harmon, McLaurin, uh, Sims. Um, you know, you have to be pretty uh, comfortable with that. And that's just the tip of the iceberg with those guys. And then uh, I go on defense, and um, for my third, and, and I, I'll say Landon Collins. Um, I know the whole box safety stuff, blah, blah, blah. Bottom line is is that whatever he he asks, is asked to do, he comes in and, and he makes it happen, uh, elevates the guys around him, uh, a short tackler, uh, something that was needed. Um, if you need him to come in and bring a little pressure uh, and see that force in the run game, he can do that. Um, I, I thought, you know, the coverage things I, I think are more than – uh, the fact that he – or less of the fact that he can't do it and more of a scheme than anything. Um, but other than that, um, you know, he, he balled out as well um, and thought that for what they paid him or what they did going, get, going and getting him a free agency is well worth it and is going to solidify that, that side uh, of the, the safety position for a long time. So uh, really hey, thought hey, those Karen. three guys did a good job. Carol, DJ, you yeah. rock. Can I just say that I think Landon Collins is one of the best free agent signings the Redskins have made for years. DJ, I, you rock. I just wanted to echo what you said about him because that was just one of the best free agent signings they've made. That's all. Agreed. I just wanted to say that. Yeah. Well said. Agreed. No well problem. Said. All right. We'll piggyback off of that with the uh, transition coming with Ron Rivera. And the uh, you know hopeful positive positive turn this team is about to take. Which unit do you think needs the most work? I know Diane, you mentioned the defense. I really don't think the defense needs as much work. I mean the injuries took a toll on the secondary, but I feel like with the secondary with the players that they they got experience, 
and with Dunbar and uh, Moreland and Moreau. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I think that you know a good off season, a good real training camp with a real coach, uh, get them conditioned properly where they can last the whole season. So uh, I, I'm really optimistic about the defense and and the whole team as a as a whole. But you see in this team every day, you know, practice and everything. Diane, which team, which unit you mentioned the defense, but do you really think that they need that much work? Or do you think that it's no, just no. due to the injuries? And, uh... Yeah, no, totally, Carol. I just the, the secondary's just been decimated. I, I I was high on the defense early in training camp and throughout the season I just all year long I was like, What the heck is going on with these guys? Because the talent is there. There's no doubt the talent is there. Um, but yeah, the, the injuries have just totally decimated them. And when you think about, you know, the guys that were in there, as you say, you know, Moreland and and all those, all the, the um, Dunbar, I think is way underrated. Um, yeah, no, it was. I I don't think. I actually think the whole team is in pretty good shape. As DJ said, the receiving core is something you can't be, you can't be too upset about with. Harmon and McLaren and I think maybe they probably you know I'll be quite honestly I'll be surprised if uh, Jordan Reed ever plays again if it was me I wouldn't but you know he's a football player and they always think that they can so tight end is a is a position I think that needs the most attention because I think that they have a great group of young receivers I think I'm glad to hear that Rivera is not afraid to put up competition for Dwayne Haskins. I mean, he didn't actually exactly say that, but he kind of said that, <laughs> you know, we don't know how Alex Smith is going to be. So the quarterback situation, they've got a couple of, you know, Case Keenum, Dwayne Haskins, and I don't know how Alex Smith is going to be, but there's going to be competition there. And Dwayne has all kinds of talent. The wide receiving core is a good group of kids. I love tight end is where I'm really concerned because I, while I love Jeremy Sprinkle, I love his attitude. My God, he's huge. You know, I love his height and I love his attitude. They have got to address that. So that's my biggest concern coming up is what they're going to do about the tight end uh, position. Did that answer your, your question? Oh, very much so. Very much so. You went yeah. great detail. Tight end, tight end on the yeah, offense. We'll... Yeah. And I love Eric I, I Powers. And I mean, that. yeah, we'll see. We'll see if Trent Williams comes back. I, I'm, you know, I've said all year long. I thought he would end up in the Burgundy and Gold, and I thought, well, we won't get into the whole Bruce Allen thing yet. That's probably coming. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I love, <laughs> I love what our offensive line did with what they, with which what they had to work. So tight, tight end is where I'm most concerned, uh, offensively. Yeah, I definitely agree with you with Jordan Reed. I think he's played his I hope he's played his last down with all these concussions. Me he's too. Received. I mean, oh, yeah, hopefully he's yeah, it, it it's not good for him to uh much as you love him. Get that hit in yeah, in week three of the preseason and not play one down during the season. I think uh mm -hmm. hopefully he sees the light and go ahead and uh, you know, hang it up. But um Yeah. It yeah. it's it, it's it's crazy. Dujanae, what do you say? Um you know, I think we've all known that this team, as young as it is, um, it, it needs leadership, uh, strong leadership. Um, and I think Rivera is a guy who does that. Uh, and, you know, I, I saw a lot of complaints about uh, different complaints about the hire, but the Redskins couldn't have done any better. And it's not necessarily about uh, the hot name, but it, it's a guy who – uh, fits whatever game plan or whatever plan you have set forth to turn this organization around. And it starts with leadership. Um, and I, I think with leadership, these guys can, can be elevated. I think that's what people have cried for throughout, uh, you know, this season and previous seasons is, is building on the talent that you have and getting the best out of them. And I think once the talent they have, is put in positions uh, where they succeed and excel best, then you're going to see a drastic improvement. And I echo Diane on offense. The big glaring bullseye is tight end. Um, I love Sprinkle, too. Guy works hard. 
a great attitude, um, you know, really gets it is all every play, but needs to be consistent, whether that's catching or, or yeah. blocking. Um, and that, that's been a problem. It really has been an Achilles heel for this offense on some of the things that they like to do, the inconsistencies at the blocking. And I know we've talked about it a lot, Carol, with, when, when Vernon Davis was healthy and when you had uh, Jordan Reed healthy, um, that, that three tight end set, you kind of mask some of the inabilities of, of Sprinkle when you can have two guys already in there that are solid blockers. And without them, he just wasn't consistent enough. So they, they have to step it up in, in that department and have to solidify that. And I think it's more than just having a starter. You're going to have to have quality players, uh, you know, stacked, I would say, um, and I, that's the only really glaring issue that I see because I think defensively the pieces are there. You got to put the pieces in place in the proper position so that you can have success. And and sometimes that that less is more thing is what you should be should be doing uh, because it's very clear when you watch the tape the back end is being asked to do way too much. That's not even including what you're asking guys in the front seven to do. So, um, yeah, you know, overall, I think if you're a coach, you're really happy about what you're walking into right now. The cupboard is not bare. And when I listen to some of these other, um, you know, national media pundits talk about this team, and, oh, why would anybody want to go there? Um, it, it's, it's, either, it's either biased or pure ignorance. So, um, you know, there's a lot to, lots of like it as a coach uh, coming into the situation. Uh, don't don't get me started on the sports media. I've had a couple of interactions this past <laughs> week on Twitter with a couple of local DC guys. Uh, I'm not going to mention their name on the air, but don't yeah, the, the negative Twitter, spin and neg- <laughs> Yeah, oh 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 don't, oh, don't worry. I, that's where I got into a little trouble. I, I jumped back into my little it. circle because yeah, it got it got a little crazy over there. All right, let's look forward. Let's uh, we talked about the past season. Let's look forward. Uh, how do you two feel about the Ron, the Ron Rivera, Jack Del Rio combo that took the Carolina team from a similar position to where the Redskins are to, you know, a Super Bowl appearance and, you know, close to winning the Super Bowl? How do you feel about that? Dujanay, I'll go to you first this time. Uh, you know, this is something that um, that is, is, if anything in Dan Snyder's tenure has ever made sense, This you know, this made a heck of a lot of sense. Um, what I thought – uh, when he came out and spoke, uh, it's clear he had a vision and a plan on where to go next, where he, whether he's talked to people around the league, experienced people, quality people uh, that he can trust in to get proper advice on how to go about it. There was a plan in full execution before they ever even got to week 17. I think that's a positive. Um, when now you talk about the coaching staff, see, there's a problem. There's a, you, you know how much I supported Jay. Um, and there's a problem, though, in the league if you want to be a head, good head coach, a quality head coach in this league. It's not all about you, and you have to realize that. Um, when you pair a guy like uh, – when Rivera pairs a guy like uh, Jack Del Rio by his side, that, that really shows uh, a sense of having someone to back you up and the same type, have the same type of mentality that you're focused on as far as the discipline that you want with a football team. Go back and look at Joe Jackson Gibbs and look at the people that he had on his staff as far as uh, the quality, knowledgeable heads that he had on his staff. There wasn't anybody that – there wasn't anything to worry about whether he was some, worrying about one of those guys taking his job or anything like that. He knew he had to have a staff and that could, could handle the things that he wanted and execute those things to the best of their ability. And sometimes – that's getting guys that could and should be head coaches to be a, uh, alongside with you. And that's why Joe Gibbs had the success as much as all these other things. But that is a focal point in success, especially in coaching in the National Football League. And uh, especially when you're green or you're young, and your first time or first time a coach, that's the best thing you can do is surround yourself with people that are better than you and not be concerned about, oh, well, hey, yeah. If I don't do a good job, they might hire that guy because he's got experience. You know, only clowns and people who have, a, have like, you know, a complex about themselves don't do stuff like that. And I think this plan, obviously Rivera has a plan. He knows what he's doing. But I think Dan Snyder deserves a lot of credit 
for having a plan in place. It wasn't a last-minute, fly-by-night, seat of the pants call. They've been working on this for months and uh, executed the plan flawlessly and uh, got a guy who I think fits this organization. It's exactly what the organization needs at this time. Now we just have to see uh, if it can work and, uh, you know, improve the football team uh, the way, uh, you know, everyone thinks that it can. Sounds good. Sounds good. You want me to chime in? Yeah, go ahead, Diane. Go ahead. Give me what you have to say. I was just going to say, spot on, DJ. Listen, Bruce Allen was out of here more than six months ago. That was already in the works. And for and, and actually, Dan Snyder, well, okay, not too much. Dan Snyder has been hatching the plan for the future for quite a while. I think knowing full well that he was going to have to do it without his buddy. And I can't um, echo enough the fact that, as DJ said, that Ron Rivera is a guy that has a plan. Dan knows he has a plan. Del Rio was the best jo- guy for the job beside him. And if they're if they get the autonomy that I think they have, and I really think they have it, there's going to be as long as we know that. Um, here's what I'm here's what I'm most concerned about is, and I think it's going to be okay is who they decide to keep in the front office because there's talk about Alex Santos maybe going. Um, I don't know. He, he he might be retained in a different position, but the last last three drafts have been really good, and Rivera knows that. So there's not going to be, I don't think, too many changes in the front office. But for these two guys to come in with the experience they have and the drive they have and Dan to just set back and let them do their thing is what I think is going to happen. I don't I don't mean to be too repetitive because DJ pretty much said it all. Um, but I think there's – I'm more optimistic than I was, you know, with Jay Gruden, with Mike Shanahan. You know, every coach that comes in a place, they, you know these guys have egos. They all think they can do it. But like um, – Ron said if he didn't think this was the right fit, he'd still be out there pitting other teams against other teams to get his services. And he spoke – he's been speaking with Dan for a while since just after Thanksgiving. Um, So they've already decided that it's the right fit. And I guess I think, you know, coming – I mean, i got to kind of come from a place of a little bit of skepticism because we've seen it before, right? We all thought – many people thought Jay was the guy. A lot of people thought Mike was the guy. But Ron's been there. Del Rio's been there. I am happy if they keep Kevin O'Connell Connell because I think it's great to have Dwayne Haskins with the same guy in his ear. We'll just have to see. But I, I do think Dan's done, done a lot of growing, and I, I think he deserves kudos for it, quite honestly. And we may see him do the sort of things that everybody's wanted him to do now that he's finally gotten that, um, what do I want to call Bruce, off his shoulder. (laughs) That was a big move. Don't underestimate how big of a move that was. Let's just say that. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, that was a huge move. Uh, It was huge. Got ahead of my next Yeah, you kind of got ahead of my next (laughs) question. Oh, I'm sorry, Carol. Oh, no, it's no problem. No that. problem at all. We're going to definitely talk about the offensive coordinator, but I want to talk about the GM situation. I just saw something came out that said that they wouldn't uh, sign the GM until after the draft, and a couple of yeah. names that's been mentioned are uh, Rick Spielman, Morocco Brown, and uh, Rick Smith, along with Lewis Riddick. Uh, what feeling do you have on any of those candidates, and do you think who will be the closest one to – Come, they will come to this team and that will help this team take it to the next level along with uh, Rivera and Jack Del Rio. Uh, Diane, I'll ask you first. You know what? You, you probably should go to DJ because having all these coaching changes and the players and stuff, I haven't, I've only just started to do research on that. I personally love Lewis Riddick, but the other guys are, are really all qualified. And um, I, I think Rivera's going to just, 
he's gonna he's not gonna do anything until he talks to everybody. Um, and 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 his uh, I, I with Dan's with Dan's thought this is a coach centric as he call as the two call it coach centric organization. I have to wonder what the GM that they bring in will be willing to. Um, I want to say not do, but not do. You know what I mean? Like what will it, so. So I'm just doing research on those guys. I want to see what their uh, attitudes are towards not having total control because I do think that Dan has given Ron Rivera a whole lot of it. And, DJ, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this because I'm only just starting to research the GM situation. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, you know, I, I like um, I like Lewis Reddick a lot. And I think when you look at a guy like Lewis Reddick, he kind of uh, really plays into what – you know, this whole thing with the coach centric, you know, look at it. Yeah. Attitude. He, right. Right. Yes. He, he's not a guy that stands out in front and wants to pound his chest and talk about me, me, me. If you even listen right. to what, before he got out here, uh, you know, as an analyst, when you heard him before, when they have him on, it's always about player centric. It's always mm-hmm. about focus on the player and what's best for an organization. And I think mm-hmm. what they're going to look to do is look for guys that can, uh, coexist, uh, and it's kind of like having that right-hand man, um, you know, Rivera having that right-hand man to make these personnel decisions, and they'll work together in that regard. And, and it'll be a title, but it, like he talked about, it'll be a collective effort. Everybody will Collaborative, have an agreement right. and, 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 you know, be on the same page. Because really, that's, that's really important. And honestly, that, that is something that has been missing um, for a long time in Washington. There's a lot of people making a whole lot of decisions and not agreeing upon them and pouting about it like babies, and, and nothing gets – no one – those fences get, you know, and bridges get burned, and, and things don't seem to work together. Guys don't work together. And if you have disruption at, from the top into the coaching staff, then what do you think is going to be displayed out and, and kind of resonate with the team? It's all Bruce gonna, wasn't exactly you know, collaborative, be, right? Right. They weren't. So right. I like them, and I think the, what Morocco Brown uh, doesn't he have a little? I believe he has a little history uh, somehow with the Redskins. So uh, that's uh, you know don't really know a whole lot about him. I think he's done a halfway decent job of where he's been. But I think when you look at the candidates, uh, you have to look at what is best for your uh, coach centric uh, organization, and I would I would. Say that probably Brown will be another guy who would fit, but I really like a guy like Lewis Reddick. Um, the, just yeah. the way he goes about his business, how he really understands uh, the necessary needs and wants, and and what is uh, what it takes to motivate players um, and 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 get the right players in the building um, and assist the coach in doing that and making those proper decisions. Um, it, that's really what I like about Lewis Reddick and, and, and out of all of those, um, you know, because there's a couple guys that you're like, they weren't necessarily all that great where they, they were uh, not, you know, you really don't want to bring another uh, crapshoot type of guy in here, um, to, you know, to kind of pair up with this because you really want to do it completely right. And, of course, it, you, your coach has to get along with him too. So I know that Ron will never be – you know, diligently involved in that and, and getting the right pieces, the right type of uh, vibe uh, at Redskins Park. So, um, and, and I've, I'll add to, to the, you know, guys still being in the building that are there previously, these guys have worked on this draft for a year, sometimes more, out. So they're not going to go blowing everything out right before the draft. So it's no surprise that these guys are going to be here through the draft because they already have – Everything worked out. The board's probably pretty much laid out before. It's not set, but they know, have an idea of people they're looking at, players they're looking at. And obviously, as we get through the Senior Bowl, East West Shrine, the Combine, we'll get, you know, they'll start to narrow things down and maybe find some new guys they want to put on the board. But these guys have done the work. So it'd be stupid to get rid of them because you get rid of them and then all the work goes with them, too. So that would set you back as far as and add another, you know, stress to the coach who already has a, you know, big deal trying to get his staff together and all those, getting no players, et cetera. 
No doubt, no doubt. I'm great at, uh, we're going to get wrap up this round. So I got a two-part question to end the Diane already touched on about the offensive coordinator. Uh, I mentioned earlier they had the name of Shermer, O'Connell, and uh, Scott Turner. Uh, two-part question, who do you – I know I, I would feel more comfortable with O'Connell, but who do you think would take this team to the next level and help Haskins be able to ascend to the quarterback that we all think he can be? And with the number two pick, do you draft Chase Young, who everyone thinks should come here? And I've been watching tape on him, honestly, and I cannot – not say we shouldn't draft them, or do you think they should uh, trade back and get more picks since they don't have a second-round pick? Dujanae, I'll go to you first. Um, I'll start with uh, uh, Kevin O'Connell, I believe, should stay on this staff, as um, Diane echoed with the, you know, the familiarity. Uh, he kind of knows, uh, you know, they'll probably keep the same type of calls. Um, and, you know, different things that uh, he's already learning. Um, and then having that continuity, the same guy in your ear all the time, uh, that would help in his growth. Um, I also see that I wouldn't take too much of the, the, the Turner interview because he very well could be brought in um, as a quarterback coach and still, um, you know, have Kevin O'Connell as the offensive coordinator. So I, I wouldn't take too much from that. But if it was left up to me, um, I definitely would keep Connell there because I think when he had the opportunity and, and Callahan kind of took the handcuffs off of him, uh, he was already handcuffed by Jay, and he kind of took the handcuffs off of him. You saw what he was able to do and, and some of the things uh, offensively, the creative things they did offensively uh, to, to get uh, Dwayne in a rhythm. Um, and when he took, he took the training wheels off, you really saw what Dwayne uh, can do and what, what pretty much been talking about since he's been drafted. Uh, know a lot of naysayers um, or whatever, but uh, you know when you do it, when you play to your player's strengths, you see them improve, and I, I think you saw that with Kevin O'Connell. I think with him. Definitely, definitely agree, yeah. Diane. What do you say? Yeah, no, I would echo. I would echo that uh, again. Um, especially because Ron Rivera is more of a defensive kind of guy. I think he, it would give Kevin O'Connell even a little bit more freedom. And he's already, I mean, if you talk to the guy, he will just talk, he, he will talk football and, you know, talk your ear off a lot like uh, Sean used to do, Sean McVay used to do. And I think he's got a lot of good ideas. Dwayne and him have a good uh, repertoire. They have a good relationship and to keep, you know, a young quarterback really needs that kind of consistency, even if it was just for one more year. Uh, I think if with with Ron and, and Del Rio doing their thing, I mean, not that he's going to ignore the offense, but he's going to – but that's just kind of his forte. So let Kevin stay in Dwayne's ear um, and and keep creating good plays, watching him develop. He's helped, helped him develop, and uh, I think that would be a great idea. And, Carol, there was a second part to your question. Oh, yeah. I missed that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going oh, to come back Young. to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chase yeah, Young, I was going to come please, back, yeah. Please keep building up that defense. I love – I cannot I cannot stress how much I love the defense. Uh, there's, maybe because I'm 4'11", I love those big guys in the trenches. <laughs> But but I'm just always I think if you get a really great defensive line, it helps the secondary, it helps the linebackers, it helps everything. And this kid has shown what you know his um, what he, his potential. And with Del Rio there, oh my God, can you even imagine? You know they're going to bring in a good defensive line guy, um, and they may have actually actually I have to look back at my notes. They might have already uh, talked about one. I, I love the, the. I think in the draft, most of the time I'm good with trading back, and because Tua is probably, you know, he's declared and he's probably going to go first, and there's a couple people looking for other offensive people. They might be able to. They're going to have to be careful, but if they can get Chase Young, I think they should. I really think they should. I think you just can't do enough about building up your defense, especially in the front seven, and especially because they're going to be switching to the 4-3, which is a whole other topic in itself, which, Carol, one day I'm going to pick your brain about that because I know you know about defenses um, <laughs> probably more than I do. But I, 
Yeah, I I I would go. I would unless other options come up the day of the draft, I would definitely go with Chase Young. Yeah. What do you um, think? Yeah, if 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 they are teams are gonna be offering like the farm. Like I, I want I want your whole draft this year and the first <laughs> next year and after that that second round pick. Uh, because right. I'm gonna tell you, if you add Chase Young to this defense and you're going to a four three, you imagine the nasty rotation of a pass rusher. You talking about Montez Sweat, you talking about Chase Young, um, right. the the fact that Ryan Anderson has stepped up, uh made plays, if you can keep Kerrigan around, I know he wants to be here, if you can keep him around at a at a you know, financially and all of that good stuff. Um, and you have those guys. You got the Hulk, Cole Holcombs coming Moving up. The outside. Good right. lord! I mean, there's no <laughs> advance of but you do. You don't go anywhere unless they offering up like they better be offering their whole draft and two more first rounders in the next two years to move out of that second spot. <laughs> <laughs> you talking about the Ricky Williams deal there? The Mike Dicker made right, right, right. the whole yeah. draft. Yeah, and, and I was totally for trading back. But with the changes, with the with the defensive minded coaches, when you got a guy like Jack Del Rio and you have this talent right. before him, and you can add that guy to what you already have, yeah, nah. You, can you imagine this? This defense could be Thank like you. the most dominant defense <laughs> in the East alone. I mean, it's just, I it's you. unbelievable what Jack Del Rio could do with that player, with the players he has and design up the most craziest stuff to attack quarterbacks, absolutely. You've got to get it. <laughs> yeah, Great minds I, think alike. I'm same, yeah, I'm feeling the same way. You know, I don't really watch college, but I've definitely been looking at some of his highlights. And the fact that he's 6'5", 256, and still growing. And, and that's yeah. he, he, can, he can tackle. He gets penetration. He has great hand placement. He can dip that shoulder. He hits the corner well. Uh, I haven't watched the full game yet. I'm gonna go back and look at some of the full game footage, but his highlight reel is ridiculous. It's, oh, a, it's Carol, insane, you know man. It. You know it. You know it. Uh, Carol knows. One more thing. Now. Just, you know that. Indeed. <laughs> oh yeah, I love. I love. <laughs> I love defense. Uh, we did have a one another move today for the. Uh, one of the noted issues with the Redskins, the head athletic trainer, Ryan yeah. uh, Vermillion. Uh, I'm not really familiar with that. I'll go to you guys real quick before we get out of here on Redskins Talk to let y'all get out of here. Uh, Diane and Dujanae, are y'all familiar with this guy? Uh, Diane, I'll go to you first. Yeah, I am a little bit. And I, it, the, I am so excited about this move because he was with the Panthers. And while there's a little bit of, you know, you know, fans, I mean, you know, fans, they love Cam Newton, and, yeah, he was hurt, but uh, Ron Rivera knows him. He's been with him, and not even withstanding, let's just say you don't even know Ron Vermillion. Larry has has been under so much fire for the injuries that have plagued this team for the last three, four, what, five years? They yeah. they They had to lose him. They had to lose him. It had to be done. And for Ron to bring in somebody that he knows, and when you think about the Panther, I mean, I, I, I could do some more research, but in the quick stuff that I've done, their injury problems haven't been nearly what the Redskins have. What I love is the, the idea that the move of losing Bruce Allen and Larry Hess could bring Trent Williams back here. And I think that in and of itself is a great reason to do what they do, but I just think because the every guy that I've talked to at, on the team seems to be fine with the with the training staff, the strength and conditioning, the doctors, except for Larry Hess, and he's been with the team for 17 years. That's a long time for yeah. there still to be the issues that they've had, and it kind of makes it all point to one place. So. It's a great move, in my in my opinion. It's a great move. I hope that it's that the new ideas, the new approach, does what the team hopes that it does. And only time will tell. But if nothing else, if 
if that move in and of itself will bring back Trent Williams, I'm good with it. And his <clears throat> record is pretty good, except for the, you know, the a couple plaguing injuries that Cam Newton has had. Um, he has a pretty good record. Yeah. Um, I have a different assessment of Trent Williams' situation, but Dujanae, I'll go to yeah, you. That's another I have a topic, right? Trent right about <laughs> Yeah, that's a whole other topic. I'm going to leave that one alone right now. Uh, Dujanae, you know what do you I say about, about this? Uh, yeah, I know. You know, right? well, <laughs> covering the NFC South for as long as I have, and, you know, I, it, word word around, you know, is he's a quality guy, you know. Um, right. He's done an excellent job, and I know people have, you know, talked about the last couple of years, but I mean, let's be truthful here, and, and that's talking to people that cover cover the South as well, and a lot of these teams. So you you get to know a lot of these teams in the area, and you know, those, those guys want to play. I mean, Cam Cam played because he wanted right. to play. Um, right. You know, let's not put it on the on the side here. He gives his assessment, but Cam decided to play. These players decided to play, and uh, their injuries didn't get better, but they they put their bodies in sacrifice for the game. Uh, so that can't be put on him. Overall, As any uh, outside of would. those things, he's had a clean record. Um, and I think it becomes like any family. Um, at times, when you get close, and and you know sometimes you you're so close that you don't see the flaws of that individual and that communication of yes, we're friends, but you know at times I'm going to have to you know, let you know that hey man, you're going to need to step it up here, or or you need to you know what can we do to 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 better this or better that and you become complacent. And I think that's uh, the deal with S, and, and that was a significant move, a fresh mind, fresh outlook, Huge um, move. a fresh look on these players. It, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's building just not just for the actual office itself, but for the players and, and the trust in the locker room. I mean, I think of guys like um, Chris Thompson, uh, the Darius guys, especially Chris Thompson, with the amount of injuries he's had over the years and how hard that boy worked to get his butt back out on the field and to continue to have these things happening, you have to look to one guy. I mean, if everybody else is cool with every everybody else in the training room except for that one guy, then, I mean, and it, it's his – ultimately it's his department and, uh, you know, you know, his role for less in, in other companies. Um, and he's been here a long time, and this has been an extended uh, problem that hasn't gotten better. It's gotten significantly worse. And it's happening to the new guys you bring in. So what does that say? You know what I mean? It doesn't say a lot about your headship in that department. And uh, that was the right move. They have to let him go. And uh, this is a significant move to bring in another quality guy. Um, and it's a fresh fresh eyes, like I said. Fresh eyes and, and the players uh, can feel a little bit more comfortable with someone that has a fresh look and a fresh outlook, fresh voice, um, and, and, and taking care of them and keeping them healthy. And, and when they do have injuries, getting them back to health. So those things are important. You know, we, we look at it as important as regular everyday people. So, of course, when when their bodies are their job, they definitely view it as something significant. And uh, this would be uh, huge as far as the entire front office and structure and gaining trust and stability in the, in, in the organization. Great, great. Appreciate the great insight. Uh, we ran a little bit longer than I expected. We still got Paul the Boxing Guy on the line to talk some boxing also. So, uh, Diane, let the folks know where they can find you. I know it's the uh, wild card weekend. We were going to wrap it up, but we have to get into that another time. Uh, let the folks know where they can find you and what you got going on in this off season with, wild, with the playoffs going on. Okay. On Twitter, I'm Di Cheesebro, at Di Cheesebro, D I. C H E S E B R O U G H. Isn't that a horrendous last name? It's so long. And uh, sportsjourney.com. That's uh, that's the website. Me and DJ. DJ, yeah. For, at Die Cheese Bro on Twitter and at and sportsjourney.com. All right. I appreciate you taking the time out. Appreciate all your knowledge and insight. And we'll definitely be talking to you soon once we're with the OTA time, and draft time, and stuff. We're trying to get you back on, and uh, I'm definitely going to be down down the training camp this year. I made it down uh, in the last season of Jay Gruden era. I definitely want to be out there for the first training camp, but a Ron Rivera era to see the differences and see how the team uh, 
perform. So definitely, I will definitely uh, be down there for that. But thanks for taking the you time out, and we me. definitely will have you back on. Oh, you yeah, know tell I will. Tell me when you're down there. Uh, really? You know, you better. Look forward uh, to it, Carol. I appreciate <laughs> right. it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, y'all take care now. You have a good night. All right, all right. And you bye-bye. too. Okay, bye bye. Do all right, do Janae. Right. Let the folks know where they can find you at, man. Uh, it's not playing 21 on everything. Um, I'm going to start ramping up the uh, podcast here uh, in the new year, getting a lot of guests on and uh, just trying to provide you guys the content. And then as, as she said, sportsjourney.com is where you can find the written work. We'll have some cool stuff coming up. NHRA season's coming up. We got the uh, senior bowls coming up. Looking forward to covering that. And, uh, of course, we'll, we'll be talking about that on the show, I'm sure. So I'm uh, looking forward to, to the off season. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Definitely going to have a lot to talk about, especially with this new changeover and new takeover. And he's making some moves. Uh, we wanted to, I wanted to get more in detail into it, but we had such a great convo. We're going to have to do it again another time. But appreciate you taking the time. Yes, sir. I'll holler you later on, bro. Oh, brother. Y'all have a good night. All right, later. All right, later, Mike. All right, we got Paul, the boxing guy, on. And he. Charlotte native, well, not going to say Charlotte native, but Charlotte resident, and he's been down there following the Panthers for a while. So he has some inside info on Ron Rivera. I'm going to bring him on right now. We can talk a little bit before we transition to boxing. Look like we're going to go into overtime a little bit. So if you want a uh, blog talk feed, you're going to lose the feed. You can always check out our Facebook Live. YouTube Live or my Periscope feed where well, we're still chopping it up about some red skins and some boxing. Paul, how you doing tonight? Good, good sir. I mean, Carl, doing pretty good. How about you? Hey, man, maintaining, having a great show. Just uh, talking some good sports and then wanted to get your take on the uh, Ron Rivera situation. I wasn't able to tune into Hurt's house with you. I heard you killed it over there breaking down Ron Rivera. So let the sports OTH fans know what they get with Ron Rivera. I'm essentially the the true talk uh, Panthers beat reporter, so <laughs> I got ridiculed by many <laughs> on uh, a lot of the Redskins groups when Ron Rivera was fired on December 6th when I said Ron Rivera head coach 2020 because this man is definitely built for the personnel the Redskins do have. He, he earned his chops in the NFL. The dude knows what he's doing. The guy always has a strong defense. And um, people are going to be pleasantly surprised, you know. Um, I will say this, though. Um, as far as personnel, I'd like to see O'Connell stay. If he doesn't, that's okay. I like Scott Turner. Scott Turner and North Turner, who's the offensive coordinator, uh, had Christian McCaffrey this season have back to have a 1,000-1,000 season. And last year he was only 200 yards short of a 1,000-1,000 season under Scott Turner. So even if we do lose O'Connell or if Turner is brought in as an assistant, it could only help, especially when you got Christian McCaffrey's former backup and replacement on our roster and Bryce Love. And, uh, by the way, Christian McCaffrey also had 104 receptions as a running back. Um, so look for a lot of passes out of the backfield. I don't think you're going to have a, a huge uh, learning curve for uh, Dwayne Haskins. And also as far as GM, you know, a lot of people are saying a lot of names. I'm really looking to them to bring in Marty Herney, the former GM of the Panthers. He got to start with the Redskins in the 80s, learned under Bobby Bassett. He built both the Carolina Panthers Super Bowl teams. He drafted Luke Keekley, Thomas Davis, Josh Norman, Steve Smith, uh, hired Ron Rivera. Um, so definitely look for that man to potentially be the GM of this team because he has a good working relationship with him. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to it. And one more thing, we need a tight end, some great tight ends in the draft coming out, and I'm pretty sure Ron Rivera has his eyes on a couple of them. Bryson Hopkins is one of them. And um, there's another guy whose name that I can't say <laughs> uh, because I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, something commit, but he's compared to Greg Olson, who was also a stud under Ron Rivera. So a uh, great hire by the Redskins, and I'm definitely happy to see what they did here. No doubt, no doubt. We appreciate that insight from the Carolina point of view, being down there with uh, the, ex, the ex-Carolina coach and giving us some insight. Now let's get into your wheelhouse. Well, you're already a wheelhouse in football, but your, your expertise and your true passion with boxing. We've had some uh, – well, I just got alerted. There's 90 seconds left in the live broadcast. So if you listen to the blog talk, it's about the live feed about to cut off. You can also come back after the show is over, listen to the show after it's rendered. Or you can jump on Facebook Live, YouTube Live, or Periscope feed and check out the rest of the talk we're about to have with boxing. But we saw some interesting uh, boxing matches in 2019. 
I saw my man Bud Crawford, you know, do his thing. We saw uh, some good fights. I'm going to go ahead and let you break it down the last month of December and uh, go from there. Hey, man, Javante Davis got a pretty, pretty uh, good performance and knockout over Gamboa by TKO in the 12th round. Um, you know, he never was really in any trouble whatsoever in that fight, and people were kind of shocked that it went that long. And I think it only went that long because Davis wanted it to go that long because he actually moved up from super featherweight to fight and win this lightweight title um, that was vacant against Gamboa. And remember, Gamboa is the guy who gave Terrence Crawford a lot of trouble early on in his career until Terrence Crawford put him out. So Gamboa is a warrior. Gamboa also uh, tore his Achilles in round two. Now, seeing as though he's not getting surgery on it, it wasn't a complete rupture, which they initially made it sound like it was. So I kind of think they're using that more along the lines as an excuse as to why he seemed like he didn't perform very well. I just think it's because he's, he's older, and Javante Davis is 22 and a superior talent. Um, so, you know, when you, don't get, when you don't get surgery on an Achilles tear, that tells you that the Achilles didn't rupture because uh, there's no way you can heal an Achilles rupture <laughs> with just physical therapy. But Javante Davis, man, he's, uh, you know, 25 years old, three-time world champ now, 23 wins, 22 knockouts, zero losses. Problem is, though, his discipline. And I love him to death, right? Great talent. I think he can be one of the most talented fighters in boxing, especially now that he moved up to lightweight where he has guys like Tevin Farmer, Terrence Crawford uh, is nearby, um, you know, at welterweight. Uh, you know, Lomachenko and these guys, Teofimo, uh, Lopez, you've got a lot, of, a lot of competition for him now. Um, and he's definitely shown that he has the talent, but he missed weight again before this fight. And he also missed weight once before at when he was, a, I think it was a featherweight, and actually lost one of his titles because he missed weight. He ended up making weight for his uh, last final opportunity on fight day. Um, he had, I think, 12 hours after he missed his first weight in, weigh in to make weight, and he just made it, which allowed him to win the title. So he's definitely going to have to work on his discipline, especially when it comes to fighting at those lower weight classes that he makes his bones in. Um, you know, he's a short guy, but he has a stocky frame. So I think he's probably going to end up at welterweight at some point, and that's maybe when you're going to see that Terrence Crawford thing happen. Um, but the only problem is I don't think they're ever going to fight just like I don't think Terrence Crawford and Errol Spence are ever going to fight because of the relationship between PBC and uh, top rank. And, you know, you know, Terrence Crawford is top rank. Terrence, you know, it's not the fighters ducking each other. It's the promoters who don't want to work with each other. So, um, you know, Javante Davis, man, once again, showing that he's a talent and a force to be reckoned with and, um, you know, looking forward to what's next. He's trying to get Terrence Crawford, but it's not going to happen. I wouldn't count on that. So, Javante Davis and Bud Crawford in the same division. That was actually my first time watching uh, Davis fight. I actually thought Dan Boyle would be able to uh, frustrate him into making a mistake. And from what I heard that he was, he did frustrate him a little bit and get him out of his uh, his game plan. But, you know, with having even any type of Achilles injury, being a boxer where your footwork and your steps are so critical that you throw him punches, I mean, the fact that it went as far as it did just states the fact that a warrior that Dan Bowie is. And, um, but seeing Davis fight for the first time, I did see flashes of Trigger Ray Leonard with that dude with the hand speed, with the movement and the footwork. So, uh, so you don't think there's no chance that Crawford would fight him or Errol Smith? Because those are two fights that I would love to see. Not this year. And, and it's not because of the fighters. It's all the promoters. And the thing about... Again, Boy, when he, when he tore the killer, he tore it when he got knocked down in the second round. And, um, you know, I'm going to tell you just something personal. You know, I've been dealing with a left Achilles strain for a very long time. And like you said, Carol, it affects your movement a lot. Um, you know, you can't do very many things, especially when it comes to boxing. Um, I will say this, though, man. He frustrated Tank, especially, I think, in round eight, which was the only round that I do believe Gamboa won. I think, you know, he's a Cuban fighter, and these Cuban fighters, they know how to make you irritated. They can take away things you're comfortable doing and make you go to plan B. And I used to always look at uh, Javante Davis and say that he has the potential to be sort of like a uh, Pernell Whitaker type of fighter. And I think the reason why in the mid-rounds he seemed to be rather sluggish, more sluggish than usual, not throwing as many punches, is because he had to figure out Gamboa. Like you said, you know, Achilles injury or not, he still figured out a way to make that fight go 12 rounds. And Javante Davis, 95 of his fights don't go past, I think, round five. So, you know, that, uh, that, that said a lot. But once again, though, you know, to knock out Gamboa, especially that late in a fight, being so much naturally smaller, because he's small. 
I mean, he's come all the way up from super featherweight. And, um, you know, Terrence Crawford right now is a welterweight. He's not in the same weight class as, as Tank right now. Um, but I do think they will end up in the same weight class because I think Javante Davis is going to have to move up to 147 because he just simply can't make weight consistently at lightweight or super featherweight. Um, I think he's going either. I think he's either going to end up a junior welterweight and then ultimately a welterweight. And then we'll see would his power carry over into those high into those higher weight classes. We see Buzz power carried over because he started off in those weight classes too. Um, I hope it happens. It needs to happen, but. Javante Davis still has unfinished business that he needs to take care of himself with guys like Terrence Farmer and Vasily Lomachenko before I think he even gets even a sniff at Terrence Crawford or um, or Errol Spence because um, I frankly don't believe Javante Davis would get a shot at Crawford before Spence does, regardless if it's a PBC uh, promotion versus top-ranked promotion or not. I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, Javante Davis definitely, even though he's a three-time champ, he still has a lot to prove because of his inactivity and his sometimes questionable disciplinary uh, issues when it comes to making weight and being active. So um, I'd like to see it happen. I mean, he has all the potential in the world, man. I mean, he, he can beat anybody. But once again, you know, what, what did John Thompson used to say all the time? Potential gets you, potential can get coaches fired. <laughs> so, you know, you mm-hmm. can sit here and have all the potential you want if you don't capitalize on that potential you know, if you don't work hard, then, you know, you're going to get left behind. And, he, you know, he definitely needs to work on that. But um, he, he put on a good show, man, and, and I was happy to see it go 12 rounds against a game, a game Gamboa passes prime or not. Um, Gamboa definitely made him earn that win. No doubt, no doubt. If he was tuning in to the Facebook Live, YouTube Live, I had a little issue with the audio. I got it set back up. So I'm going to give Robbie the Brenda the MP3, put it back on, and I'll re-put it out there because uh, we missed, like, the first five minutes of the segment, but I'm going to make sure I get that fixed up. Uh, Paul, what other uh, fights? I know we had a busy end of 2019. Uh, what do we have coming up in the beginning of 2020? Any interesting fights or anything, or is it slowed down for boxing with how, how many fights we had towards the end of the year? It's slowed down for right now. So February is the month where it picks back up. That's when you're going to get the Deontay Wilder versus uh, Tyson Fury rematch. And then we'll probably start to hear more about what's going to happen with Anthony Joshua's next opponent um, and what's going to happen with Dillian White as well because we got a lot of sanctioning bodies and mandatories that these fighters have to try to negotiate to get out of so they can defend their belts and not get stripped. Um, we did have a controversial fight, though, on the undercard, of Javante Davis with Badu Jack, who's a warrior, but always seems to have bad luck, whether it be an open gash on his forehead, questionable decisions. He had a, uh, I think it was a draw. Um, maybe it was a loss. I may, I may be mistaken to uh, John Pascal, a light heavyweight. He's a good game fighter, but he's a little yeah, older. Was a loss. So is Badu Jack. Was it, a, was it a draw, Carol, or was it a loss for Jack? It was a lo- I, I was watching that fight. I was actually at work working at the club, and they had the under they had the fight on. And I remember you talked about Badu Jack. I actually followed him on Instagram after you told me about him. And uh, Pascal just had a great game plan. He was taking the space away. He wasn't allowing him to use that jab that he's used to using. And he actually uh, got got uh, Jack down, knocked him uh, knocked him on his butt one time. And it was a close fight. I think it was a split decision, but uh, Pascal yeah. did end up winning. And uh, Jack just didn't look comfortable. Pascal took away the space. And the, the time and space that he was used to, he didn't let Jack use his jab to, you know, to, to dictate the fight. And when he had opportunity to take it to him, he took it to him. Jack came on late in the fight, but I think it was just after that knockdown, I think it was in the sixth or seventh round, I just think it was a, a little bit too much for him to overcome. But Pascal definitely earned that win. And let me tell you, Pascal is a real slick boxer. He's been in the ring against guys like Bernard Hopkins that been around for a while. And, um, you know, a lot of times, just like the Tyson Fury versus Deontay Wilder fight, even though I didn't agree with the decision being a draw, I mean, you got to look at it like this, though. If it wasn't for the knockdowns, it wouldn't have been a draw. So, I mean, yeah. you know, so you know, and, and the thing about Badu Jack is he likes to fight in the phone booth. He will fight you in close. And if you take that away and yeah. you create space and dictate the range and pace of that fight, it puts Badu Jack at a disadvantage. So, um I'm glad. I'm glad you got to see that whole fight, Carol, because I missed a good portion of it. But when, when which, what you said happened, now I can see it totally happen in that way because um, you know I like both of these guys. They're both vets, savvy. But um, if you can if you can get Jack out of his comfort zone and kind of control that that distance and keep him at range, 
he really has a difficult time adjusting. Uh, well, I won't say difficult time, but um, it takes some time to adjust, and that's when you end up getting those flash exactly. knockdowns, like you said, ended up happening to him and uh, essentially cost him the bout. That's exactly what happened. It took him too long after the knockdown. I think it was the sixth or seventh. By the eighth round, he had figured out, and he made it a fight up and made it so close, but it took him a little bit too long to adjust to what Pascal was doing. Man, it's so yeah. I, I don't I don't like to call I, I say controversial when I see other people say robbery. Because like you said, he got knocked down. People say Tyson Fury got yeah. robbed. Well Tyson Fury got knocked down twice by Wilder. Whether you agree with the draw or not, you got knocked down twice. Wouldn't have been a draw if you wouldn't have got knocked down twice. You know? So I mean <laughs> you, you Yeah, you you, you can't what do they always say? If you the champ, you gotta beat the champ. You can't leave it in the in, in the judge's hands. And that adage still applies today. If you ask me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So uh, we got the fight coming up in February. So uh, let's, let's, well, let's, what you got work? I know you were working on some uh, articles that you're going to put out on the True Sports Without the Politics blog. We'll let the folks know what you're working on before we get up out of here. Oh, yes, indeed. I spoke briefly about Ron Rivera, but I got a lot to say about him, um, just following him and being very excited about that move. And, and was, when, when I saw he was let go, I was just hoping that the Redskins got him um, – you know, because of what he can bring to the table and with our draft position and um, the guys they have sort of like Dujane said, you know, and, 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 and Diane, this defense is not in bad shape. And Ron Rivera is a guy who can definitely get this team to peak form. So that's an article I'm working on. I just want to get all my stats and, and information lined up right. And I'm also going to write a little bit more about the uh, Javante Davis, uh, uh, Vasily Lomachenko, uh, Tevin Farmer and Errol Spence mess we got going on <laughs> right now and what we can look forward to in 2020. Um, so it's mainly going to be a 2020 boxing preview and just an overall, um, you know, nice to meet you article about Ron Rivera in case any Redskins fans may not be too familiar with him and his history. No doubt, no doubt. Let, know, let the folks know where they can find you at, man. Yes, indeed. Find me on Instagram, pugilist <laughs> underscore HQ. P U G I L I S T underscore H Q, and also on uh, Instagram at um, P from Charlotte. That's the letter P from Charlotte. And uh, I may have to make a correction. I don't know if the first time if I said Pugilist H Q was on Twitter or not, but if I did say Twitter, it's a correction. That's on Instagram. So Pugilist underscore H Q on Instagram or P from Charlotte on Instagram. All right, Paul. Appreciate you taking the time out, man. Appreciate the insight. We'll talk to you later on, man. You have a good night, and we'll holler back at you, bro. Yes, indeed. Great show as usual. Thanks for having me on. All right, man. You have a good night. I'll holler at you later on, bro. Yes, sir. All right. Well, we didn't win the overtime for the second, for the first time of the new year, for second time in the last month, because we got so much great content. We got to share it with you, even if it goes into overtime. I'm about to get ready to get out of here. Appreciate y'all checking us out, sportsothp.com. For all the shows, archive, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, Periscope Video, all the articles that he's working on, for the box guy that I'm working on, TC3. You can check out the Facebook page, Sports OTHP, for the articles that do your name right. We got sports coverage coming from any and every direction, people. It's not a game. D.C. sports are the politics. It's not a catchphrase. It's not just the motto. It's what we do. I'm about to get out of here. I'm about to end this feed. Before I do, got to end this show with Beats by CP3, Hip Hop. We out. See you next week, Monday night, 7 o'clock as always. Capital, Wizards, and whatever else you want to talk about. Whatever goes down throughout the week before we be back. CP3, live from the lab, Sports and Podcast, True Radio Network. And I'm out.